Thank you. Uh, okay, can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh-oh. Too bad. Um, well, um, first thing I would say is that all, all good stories are about moments of decision. Um, even if they don't seem to be about a moment of decision, I mean, a lot of times it feels to us, or to me anyway, that the greatest stories feel like a, a stray dog wandering, you know, from dumpster to bush um, to Labrador retriever, to sort of wandering through the town. But they will always be, if they're good, they'll always be about a moment of decision. Pat. When I was growing up in Jersey City, I wasn't a bad kid. I was just a little mischievous. In summer school, one of my buddies wanted to buy a gun. I just happened to know a guy who was selling the gun, Lenny. So I went to Lenny's and I picked up the gun and the next day I brought it to school. Well, Frankie, before he bought it, he wanted to test fire it. So we took it down to this swampy area down by the Hackensack River and we set up some cans. Pop, 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 pop. You know, we were shooting at the cans. Next thing I know, I heard some other pops, but they weren't my pops. I looked over and I saw this big bald headed white guy with this crazy look on his face and he was shooting at us. And I could hear the bullets whizzing in the weeds past my legs. I wasn't waiting to find out why we were getting shot at. We just took off running. And I don't think we stopped running for about a week. Later, I gave Lenny the 40 bucks that he wanted for the gun, but I charged Frankie 50, and I kept the extra 10 for myself, and we bought beer. And we were sitting around drinking beer, laughing about what happened. And I think that's when me and Lenny decided we were gonna become cops. <laughs> So when I show you uh, some of the other videos, I'm going to be asking you about uh, what you think the moment of decision is in these stories. Um, but I want to talk a little about Walter Benjamin, um, who was born in 1892 um, and who was a German philosopher. And he wrote a, a, a famous essay, which is um, popularly called in English, The Storyteller, um, in which he talked about what he considered the death of the story. It was after World War II, and he felt that uh, the world, the complex modern world, had utterly overwhelmed stories, because stories are really about uh, uh, the transmission of experience, and experience, he felt, had become worthless after World War II. Uh, Inflation would overwhelm any of, you know, the, the normal experiential ideas that we might pass from, um, from father to child uh, about frugality. Um, that was wiped out. Obviously, the, uh, the mechanism of war had destroyed uh, uh, our experience of how to deal with war. And the, the complexity of life had utterly overwhelmed, fragile human life. So we felt that we, um, the stories were no longer effective the way novels had become, because novels that we experienced in isolation gave us, and by the way, I'm taking a very, very simple view um, of an extremely complex argument um, that he made. He felt that but, but he felt that novels were our way of, uh, first of all, l learning and dealing with, with the ideas of death, but they, that, that we did so in this very isolated, personal way. In a way that stories and fairy tales um, could no longer affect us. But I think that what we have seen in the last uh, 20 years, and particularly with this great resurgence of personal storytelling. I think we've seen sort of a new way in which stories can deal with this incredibly complex 
uh, modern life. And, and they do so by becoming, first of all, very, very personal. And they are about our isolated uh, experiences. And they are always about how we deal with death and the cosmos. And I'm going to get into that a little more. But I want to talk about the moment of decision in, in any story. Um, there are these moments of decision. And um, e even in the, in the short little stories that I'm going to be showing, they're not always just the moment of decision of the narrator. Sometimes the narrator comes to a decision, and then um, another character will come to a decision. So it's a play of these two decisions. Or it can be the narrator versus the universe. Patty, will you play the next? Oh, and look for the, look for the moments of decision, because I'm going to be asking you about them. It's my first day of the census, and I'm really excited about going house to house in Brooklyn, knocking on people's doors, asking them, are you black, white, exotic, what's the deal? And as I do, I'm submitting my paperwork, including my identification, my driver's license. When I meet one of my neighbors, Eloise, she turns over and she sees this little dot on my license. She says, oh honey, what's that about? I say, oh, you know, I'm a donor. In case anything were to happen to me, God forbid. You know, I wouldn't mind giving up a leg, a eyeball, whatever. She smiles and has this glimmer in her eyes, and we come, become quick friends going out to different places in the census, including this one house that was really sketchy in bed -Stuy. She's like, oh, no, 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 honey, that's a crack house. You don't smoke crack, do you, Dawn? And I turn to her, I say, no, Eloise, I don't smoke crack. Why do you ask? She says, Dawn, I need a kidney. Will you be a donor? I said, hell no, I mean, I'm down for the homies, but I'm not about to give a kidney to some woman I just met from the census. <laughs> so, I want to I want to talk to people, um, but first I want to say why these moments of decision are so important. You know, we have uh, lo lots of folks will tell stories in which there really are no moments of decision. They can be, they can seem like the most exciting stories. It might be, you know, we've had people come and they tell stories of an accident that they've had and, um, and they go plunging off a cliff and they're lying there for a couple of days and, um, and you know, somebody comes and rescues them. And you think, oh, this is going to be the most amazing story. But those stories don't work well because you feel as though it's just the universe. Um, acting on people, and it's not this, this connection. It's between you and the universe. And so, so I always find the great stories are moments of decision. And I would ask you, first of all, there are two, I think, decisions in this story that are important. There's, first of all, the decision of Don's friend. And what, what, what is that? What do you see as the moments of decision in this story? Somebody raise a hand. I know you don't want to. I'm just going to pick out people if I don't get a hand. <laughs> she, yeah, go ahead. She had to decide whether to ask her for a kidney. Right, and then, wait, wait, and then what's the response? Well, it's immediate, no. <laughs> I mean, d no consideration, just no. Right, and what did you think about that response that she made? Let me, let me, let me go over there. You were, you... What did I think about the response that Dawn made? Yeah, that Dawn made. What do you think about Dawn's response? Well, I, I think a Start about the question is, wait, wait till, wait, oh, wait till we get over God there. knows I'm loud That's enough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What's oh, okay. your name, by the way? Uh, my name is Susan Lockman. Hi, Susan. Um, okay. Um, I think that Dawn was uh, startled by the question, and that question took her to a place that she hadn't considered. Like she said, she was down with the homies who had an accident or something. She hadn't really considered, even though she decided she'd be a donor, it was in a whole different scenario. So she suddenly got this question, which was a totally uh, out of the realm of what she'd already considered. Right. Do you feel sympathetic with her? I, I feel startled with her. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so you think her response was? I think I'd probably have responded the same way, but it would send my thoughts in a new direction. Right. And what is it that's sort of funny about that response? Who else? Yes. The idea is I've got to die first before I donate. 
Oh. Oh, wow. That's, that's interesting. That's the idea. What? Say that? The idea is that I have to die first before I donate. Right. But I don't think that she means that. You know, a don you, that's you, what she meant. No, I don't think she meant that. With her little dot? No, no, no. With her I little she, dot? You don't think so? No, no, no. You don't have to die before you donate. You do know that. No, I know. Yeah. Right. But she didn't. But she, in my mind, she wanted to die, and then after she was dead, she'd give away some stuff. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sir. What is your feeling about this, sir? <laughs> Don't touch them. Oh, microphone. no. I wonder, it, she seems like a bit of an unreliable narrator here. Like, <laughs> like she she's jiving right. with Eloise. Right. Yeah. You, you don't really think she, she was quite... So abrupt with Eloise. Hell no. No, I don't think Eloise was actually fronting up and asking her for a kidney, please. Oh, right. And I don't think Dawn was actually saying, you know, seri a serious no to a serious question. I think they were, she was, this was a story about two women becoming friends over jive. Oh, wow, that's Oh, I don't think so. That was just my take. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting take on it, that, they, that neither of them were, com were completely being serious. I, I, don't, I don't know whether Eloise, ca I think maybe she, what she was doing, maybe was thinking if she, ha if she did say that because she knew she was sniffing around, this is what her answer was going to be. Yeah. But you know, these are, tr these are true stories. All moth stories or these stories, they have to be true. But we don't have a police force. <laughs> and we don't have a, a, a moth bureau of investigation. People are always asking about it, that. Um, how, how can you be sure that they're true? In fact, there have been big scandals. Malcolm Gladwell told a story at the Moth, and then there was a big scandal because somebody, Jack Schaefer, an investigative reporter, found out that he wasn't telling the literal truth. And so this became, you know, a big, a big thing. Our, uh, but, but there needs to be at least the feeling when you're listening to the story that they're pretty true, you know, just sort of true the way, uh, you know, they're true if you're drunk, you know, and telling a story. Um, and that seems to lend it some kind of extra power, the personal part um, and the true part. <coughs> These stories are uh, a part of a project that I've been working on called Sudden Owl. I, I realized that the, the moth, you know, everyone loves to listen to the moth, um, but those are, you know, the stories go on for 10 minutes and people don't really want to watch them on video. And I thought, oh, people are really kind of losing a lot by not being able to see the faces. But I know that people will gladly watch things that are uh, a minute long, you know, or maybe a little longer. So this was, this was my test to go out and film a hundred of these stories uh, and all at a minute and see how they work. And now there's uh, a lot of people who want to, you know, they want us to do a big website with these, and so we will probably be doing that after I'm done with this novel, um, which is probably 2024. Um, but it's supposed to be ready next month. Um, and so I want to say also now, as you start looking at these moments of decision, it's not always the decision of the narrator, and it's not always the decision of somebody else, oftentimes I think it's the decision of God that plays a big role in these stories. It's the decision of the universe. It's how the universe reacts to our decision. So watch this, Pat. So I really didn't want to be there. I'm visiting my mother in her assisted living home. It gets old, it gets hard after a while. I'm driving it from Pittsburgh, it's cold, it's winter, it's snowy. It's a little claustrophobic in her little studio. So I say, let's take a walk. She says, fine. We get in her wheelchair, we cross 11 mile, we go into what's a cemetery, and you know, it's a little morbid, but I don't care. And my mother says the same thing every time. What a nice park. Why aren't there more people here? I kind of laugh to myself, but I don't say anything. We go back in, we play bingo. She has a card, she doesn't win. We have ice cream, then we have dinner. Then six, 6.30, time for bed. Put her in her bed, pull up her covers, push her hair back, kiss her. I tell her I love her, and then she says, this has been the best day of my life. If only Jane were here. 
So you realize that's Jane. <laughs> Patty, can you help me? I'm going to run you back and forth. Um, so, so who, uh, what were the decisions that you see in this? These are a little bit harder to see, these decisions. First, the decision of Jane. That's, that's what I would like to know. What's Jane's decision? She decides to go even though she's really ambivalent. and she really doesn't want to be there. Right. So she decides not only to go, but to keep going. Stay and participate and be involved. How many of you all have been involved in taking care of parents with, yeah. Um, yeah, and so the, so it's that decision that you have to make every single day over and over and over to do this uh, horrible thing. And then what, what's the decision that, that she's, what's the returning decision, the response? Who has a thought about that? There we go, up there. What's your name? Arlene. Arlene. Hi, Arlene. Our mother had the best day of her life. Right. And that meant everything. Right. My mother came, had a stroke, and stayed seven years. I understand her dilemma. Right. I know that I had a, a, a nurse that came and uh, told me, can I be frank with you? I said, sure. She said, not only uh, is your mother hurting your you're not your mother hurting you, you're hurting your mother. And I said, how? I said, you're depriving her of her community. And her community was her daughter, even though she didn't recognize her, her daughter understood her needs. And huh. that was the need that she needed to do. Because when her mother's gone, she won't have that opportunity again. Right. So, so even though her mother doesn't recognize her, she has to... That's the that's what has to be. It's, it's, your, it's your child duty to it's, your to your parent. It's, it's a parental thing. It, and, right. And, and if when it, when and if she right. dies, you regret those days you didn't spend. Right. You didn't go, even though she didn't recognize her. Right. Right. And that's why I think this is a really interesting story because I don't think it is about the mother saying, um, "This is the best day of my life." I think it's really about I really I think it's about the fact that her mother says if only Jane were here meaning this is all you our connection is gone but you're still here and to me the the the, the decision is the decision that the universe is giving which is to say you, you need to do this even though it feels like utter despair. I mean, that's the worst thing she could hear. The most crushing thing she could hear is her mother saying, if only Jane were here. Because it, it takes everything away, yes? Unless she said, I'm glad Jane wasn't here. <laughs> I'm glad Jane wasn't here? Wow. I don't think that that would be any worse. I really think at that point, it's all, <laughs> it doesn't matter. By the way, that's what her mother often did say. Just it's as kind a, of a gift back to her, too, thinking about, thinking about, hey, my mom enjoyed the time that she had with me. Yeah. I'm glad that she would want to be with me. Yeah, exactly. So it's yeah. A gift back to her also. Yeah. But there is that moment of despair that she's telling us about. I mean, the... The, the reason that we all went, ah, was we felt how painful that was. And I think that's because that is the response of the universe. The universe often responds to our most noble gestures. By the way, this never happens in Hollywood. In Hollywood, at the end of the movie, you know, you, you get a reward for the things that you do. But in beautiful stories, there often is no reward. There is only a bit of knowledge and learning. So we began to see this as I began to work on the, uh, on the moth. You know, I started the moth in 1997. And uh, at first, I just thought, you know, I was in New York. I'd had this successful novel. And yet I was finding, and you know, I loved my New York life. But I, I found that I missed the stories that I had as I was growing up in Georgia, on, you know, on St. Simon's Island off the coast of Georgia. 
Um, and I miss particularly nights at Wanda Bullard's house where we'd go to her porch and sit around and drink and moths would come in through the screens and go swirling around the uh, porch light and you know we'd be getting drunker and drunker and telling stories all night and the stories would often go on and on and on and in New York you can't go on and on with a story when you're at a cocktail party you'll be interrupted in 12 seconds there are vultures standing around at all times ready to interrupt you as soon as your story gets a little delicate so I thought well why don't I create a venue where people can tell long personal stories um, kind of you know rock and tour stories that I had always loved. And so we started the moth the very first night, got a big audience in my loft, and it was awful. It was just the worst, just really um, long stories that felt like they had to have a moral, there had to be some kind of purpose to these stories. And I felt as though people didn't know how to, t how, how to tell those kind of kitchen stories anymore. And I was about to give up, and then a friend of mine said, no, this is actually a really good idea. It's just that you, we, you've got to find really good storytellers. And so we started looking around in the city, and I met a man named Jonathan Ames, who has since become famous. Uh, he has shows on HBO. What's that show he has now called Mr. Blunt? Do you know this one? The, the, all right. Um, anyway, um, he had a show called Bored to Death um, for yeah. years on HBO, yes. Um, and he's a brilliant, brilliant man. And he told a story about uh, his, uh, when he was little, um, he had discovered how to masturbate. And he was so excited that he went to run to show his mother what he had produced. <laughs> now this is the kind of story that we just think about, but we couldn't possibly tell. But he was, uh, unafraid to show that kind of vulnerability. And, 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 and when we put that story on, it was a smash success. And we began to realize that one of the great secrets to personal storytelling is an ability to reveal one's vulnerability. And that became really the key to the success of the moth. Let's watch one more. Shadow and I couldn't afford an apartment, so he built me a little cabin in the woods out of pallets. He covered them with indoor-outdoor carpet. We even had a, a kerosene heater in there. It was quite cozy. And uh, one morning we woke up because we smelled smoke. And uh, we walked outside. And there was flames going on. The whole place was engulfed in flames. And we realized it was Big Teddy Sharon that had set it on fire. She was screwing Shadow while I was in jail. And when I got out, he told her to leave, but she didn't. So that's my dear friend Brenda, um, who lives under the Harry S. Truman Parkway in Savannah um, in a community of um, uh, homeless people and alcoholics. Um, and uh, when she came to tell her stories, she was uh, a little too drunk and um, but I noticed that her, she didn't have her false teeth with her. And I said, where's your teeth? And she said, oh, I left them back under the parkway. So I said to the intern, I said, could you drive her back to pick up her false teeth and go the long way? And so we just waited. And by the time she came back, she was sober and then told us five brilliant stories. And they're all brilliant because she's willing, I think she's willing to reveal her vulnerabilities. What kind of vulnerabilities? This is this this is what I want to talk about. So, what are the vulnerability that that she showed there? Where does where is the strength of that of of that story? Or do you think it's not a strong story? What the vulnerability of being cheated on while you're away? Right. 
There's that. She was in jail. She didn't mind telling us about that. What else? Homeless, place built out of pallets. Right. And yet. Right. Who was it with that? Right. I also loved, like, the the detail of the of the carpeting, you know, and 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 the very fact that she felt that that was luxury. I thought that that was beautiful. Um, so I love. Yes. I think the point at the end, way, the point at the end when she's well, no, hasn't won. You know, she's because <clears throat> I'm really not winning at the end of that story. Right. And sort of lost something. Right. She loses at the end, and this is what I think makes that story very brilliant and profound, and why we connect to it. We connect to the stories of great vulnerability. I, we have a lot of celebrities who tell stories at the moth, and they usually tell stories about how um, they went into a situation and everybody was screwed up, um, and yet, and the, you know, the, it was very amusing, and but also kind of amusing how they were able to prevail in the situation of, of where they were surrounded by clowns. But the really good raconteurs realize they are the clowns. And they go into situations where everybody is trying to do the best that they can for them. But they are inveterate clowns, and they will screw everything up. And Walter Benjamin began to realize that this was sort of a key to modern existence. And he particularly realized that as he was very old, uh, not uh, he wasn't old, but as he was uh, uh, very ill um, uh, toward the end of his life, he remembered a, a creature that he'd always been terrified of. And it was this sort of hunchback that his mother used to talk about that all uh, Jewish mothers in Germany talked about um, called Mr. Bungle. And when things would go wrong, she would say, Mr. Bungle sends his regards. Mr. Bungle is this sort of clown that presides over our lives. And, and Mr. Bungle sent his regards to Walter Benjamin again and again and again. He was a total disaster in his life. I mean, one particular mistake he made was as the war was beginning to come, first of all, he had decided he was going to stay uh, uh, in Germany. And he wasn't going to flee as his friend Gershom Scholem did. He wasn't going to go to Israel. But he felt comfortable um, staying in Germany. And then finally, he, he was in Paris. And as the war began to approach, World War II, he fled to a little town that he thought would be perfectly safe, which happened to be the front. And so then, by s there Mr. Bungle sends his regards again. And, but again, a certain amount of luck, and he was able to survive for a while. Um, and, then, um, and, and then began a series of, of disasters that led him uh, to Marseille, and then he climbed up into the Pyrenees, but he was carrying too much with him. He had this. He, he decided he had to keep his volume uh, that he'd been working on of his new philosophical work. So there's hundreds of pages he's carrying on his back to get over the Pyrenees, to get to Spain, and to see if he can make it to the United States. He's, but they keep making little mistakes along the way, and he becomes very, very ill. And he's in a little town in the Pyrenees. Um, and again, and again, Mr. Bungle sends his regards. And these are the stories that we most identify with. Let's, let's watch one more. I'd been on a date, and it was the best date of my life. And when it ended, she said that she didn't want me to call her. She'd call me in a few weeks or when she was ready because she wanted to think. And I knew what that meant. Don't call me, I'll call you. And I went home to the Midwest and it was minus 24 degrees. So I put my old dog, my old rescue dog, into the back of my Mini and I drove to Florida. I drove for two days 
And in Florida, at my friend's house, I finally got to sit and think, and I thought, you know, I was happy for three days. And for 20 years, I've been miserable. And if I never get anything more than that, I got three days of happiness. And that's enough. And I looked at my dog, and my dog looked at me. And then the phone rang. So, so first of all, what does it mean when the phone rings? That she calls. Does anybody know who she is? I don't know. Do we have any Neil? Oh, we have a Neil Gaiman fan here. Who is she? Is it her? Is her wife Amanda Palmer? Yes, it is. It's Amanda Palmer. And um, so Amanda Palmer is a rock and roll. What, what's the name of her band? Sure, actually. Is that the, it's not the Dresden Dolls? Is that, is that what it is? Dresden. Anyway, she's a big rock and roll star. They all love her. Um, um, and, and, and Neil Gaiman, you know, is a big guy who, um, again, I think he's showing vulnerability here. Um, by the way, what are the moments of decision? What's the decision that, that he makes? Drive yeah, but shut the door. Shut the door, and but there's more than that. He he makes a a deeper decision. He makes a decision that she's not going to call him, and to be at peace with. He doesn't want to go through the humility that he's gone through evidently before. Right, but but there's another decision he makes. To be at peace. To be at peace with it. Right. Right. And <laughs> yes. What? Yes. Hi, darling. How are you? Happiness. He actually experienced joy for three days. What a blessing. Right. That's it. Right. And he almost and it takes a certain amount of decision to say, I'm going to do this. I don't I know that heartbreak is upon me, but I am still going to live. It's the hardest decision that we make. And almost everybody at some point in their lives, and sometimes often in their lives, has to make that decision. I am heartbroken, but I will still love life somehow. I'll find a way. It's the, most, it's the thing that I'm always so interested in. Um, and uh, the, oh, and then what's the, what is the response that he gets? Ring, ring. Ring, ring, and that response is from Amanda Palmer. But I also sort of think it's the response of the universe. Yeah. Sometimes the universe gives us, you know, for whatever reason, God gives us what we look for. Who knows why? Um, let's watch one more. We was in Toronto, and my, one of my best friends, his name's Troll. He walks like a troll, talks like a troll, and the only place he'll sleep is under the bridge. But we have been sharing a point of dope, which is uh, two shots we have been sharing. Uh, and um, he decides one night when he makes bank, he wants to do uh, two points. And I told him, I said, troll, you can't handle two points. And he ended up, because he couldn't, his veins were so little, he couldn't shoot himself, so I shot him. And I didn't even push all the dope in him, I only pushed like half of it in him. I checked him and only pushed half. But he puked. When he puked, he laid his head back like that and he drowned it in his puke that quick. Right in my lap. Right. And he's like one of my most best train riding friends. And but and they had to ship him all the way back to to um America. Right. And I love him. I sure miss him. <laughs> That is um, my dear friend James, uh, who is, by the way, Brenda's boyfriend, sometimes. Um, what dis what uh, decisions does James, what decision does James make? And what's the response? This is, this is sort of interesting, because this is where it starts getting, who has some theories? Yes. Oh. Wait, you had an answer? I was going to answer. Yo, wait, you answer. Uh, he That's makes okay. the decision to be the 
He makes the decision to give the friend the trucks. But he makes the decision to not give him all that he wants. Yeah, uh, but that's not going to make a difference because he's really it's, he's going to die anyway. I kind of think that James doesn't make any real decisions. This is my th thought about James. I think James is the epitome of Mr. Bungle. Every day, because I know James very well, every day he gets crushed by the universe. The response of the universe is like when Troll dies. And, or you saw that half of James' face has been beaten in. Again, just a series of non-decisions. It's not like he was making decisions to go to, this, to that bar and hang out with those vicious train kids. He just is rolling along. Um, so I think non-decisions also can sometimes be like decisions. Um, Gershon Scholem uh, was Walter Benjamin's best friend who had gone to Israel trying to persuade Benjamin to come to Israel, knowing that the Nazis were um, vicious. Scholem is making this sort of brilliant decision. He can see something about human nature that Benjamin can't really see. And Benjamin was always, all his life, sort of reaching towards Sholem, because Sholem was a mystic and was the great, uh, you know, the author of, of great works on, on the Kabbalah and on Gnosticism. And I so, so Sholem's view of the universe because he was a Kabbalist, uh, and he was very moved by uh, Isaac Luria and uh, Kabbalistic thought, which was based on Gnostic thought. So just to sum it up in three or four sentences, um, there was, at one point, there was this Godhead who was all of the world, and the Godhead decided to pour part of himself into these vessels in the form of light. But the vessels became so full of light that they burst. And pieces of the light were sent scattering all over the universe. And now, those pieces of light are working their way back toward the Godhead. And they're little splinters of light. And we know these pieces of light as gnosis, as, as wisdom. The little tiny bits of wisdom that we get from the universe. So when Jane hears this response um, from her mother, who says, if only Jane were here, to me, that's, that's as though the, the great reward for Jane and all of her work is only that she gets this bit of, of wisdom. And I think the same thing is going on with, uh, with James, when he uh, gets, when, when Troll, dies and he's thinking about it as he's telling the story and he has nothing to offer us. He has gained nothing from this experience other than a bit of gnosis, a little bit of that light. But somehow because we make ourselves a vessel for this light, we are in some way restoring the wholeness of the universe. This was Sholem's view. Um, now I want to bring up uh, well, I just did a workshop here, amazing workshop uh, with these Joseph Sobel's students. Um, and so we're going to bring up three students and they're going to tell their one minute stories, one right after the other. And there's going to be vulnerability and decisions and no so. So may I um, introduce them? Come on up. Uh, it's um, Wenny uh, Elrod and Joseph Bowman and Chuck uh, Canolfi, right? Did I get the pronunciation? Oh, sort of. Okay. And um, so, who, so you're going first? Is that right? Okay, great. So, so, so when uh, he's done, if you guys will just go up and tell your stories, and then, and then we'll give them all a big cheer at the end. I 
had this dream where I had crash landed a spaceship on a planet far from home. And knowing that I was probably going to die due to lack of oxygen, I, I decided the best thing for me to do would be to dig my own grave and wait for death. But death never came. And I would breathe in thinking that each breath was going to be my last. And the more I, I took these breaths, the more angry I got until I, I got to a point where I was just breathing and so mad that I couldn't die that I just screamed, why am I still here? And I woke up and I sat up in bed in a cold sweat, breathing so heavily. And I reached for my phone and I started going through our text messages again. And I came across one of the last text messages she sent me and it just said, so are we broken up yet? And I had replied saying, being broken up implies that something is broken and I don't think that's the case. And I couldn't breathe. So I deleted our messages and I deleted her from my contacts and I allowed myself to be broken. I'm causing that feedback, so I'm gonna go over here. Thank you. So you're going to absorb it. I'm just going to be here, and then I won't cause feedback anymore. <laughs> get, get right up under your chin there. Yeah, I think that's better for me. It was a beautiful day on the Zimbabwean savanna. The sky was severe clear, so blue that it hurt your eyes to look at it. And my parents had flown down to see their newborn baby granddaughter. And I was going to take them up for a day of flying over Africa. So we went down to the airplane. I checked the gas. I checked the oil. And we hopped in the plane. We trundled out to the runway. And we started taxiing down the runway, speed building, airspeed coming up, uh, speedometer coming up little black dots scattering over the windshield. Little black dots. And as we took off into the air, the little black dots became big, big black rivulets. And the big black rivulets became sheets of brown pouring over the windshield and completely obscuring anything I could see. There was oil pouring all over the aircraft and now is my chance to be a hero. I grabbed the microphone and I called Mayday, just like they do in the movies. Mayday, Mayday, and they told me I could turn around and come back and land on the runway. So using all of my piloting skill, everything I had learned, this was the moment I had been trained for. I turned the plane sideways, came crabbing in towards the runway, and just as we got over the runway, planted the wheels on the runway and saved my and my parents' life. And as I taxied up to the hangar, the old airplane mechanic sitting there said, hey, Joe. Another asshole left the oil cap off. Recently, our youngest daughter had to have reconstructive knee surgery. So I flew out west to stay with her and help out. After the surgery, she had to have physical therapy. In the clinic was an 84-year-old woman who had had both shoulders operated on the same time. And she asked the nurse, do you know the difference between terrorist and a physical therapist? <laughs> and the nurse is like, I have no clue. She said, that terrorist will negotiate. <laughs> Meanwhile, the therapist is working with my daughter. There's that swollen, unrecognizable knee. And she's bending her leg and bending her leg and saying, now you tell me when you can't stand it anymore. And she's pushing and pushing, and I saw my daughter's pain. I wanted my daughter to walk again. 
I wanted her to be able to ride her bike and kick her soccer ball. And I thought, please, don't negotiate. Don't negotiate. Let's have a big hand for all three of these incredible storytellers. All right, guys, hey. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so I just, well, I'm going to ask you quickly, just get, tell me one moment in those stories. Just think of one moment that moved you. I allowed myself to be broken. I, I allowed myself to be broken. Which is, by the way, uh, his decision, right? Yeah. That's another moment. Don't negotiate. Don't negotiate, yeah. Don't negotiate, again. This idea there she's, there, she's really dealing with this idea of decisions, decisions that have to be made. That is what, where I think stories gain their great power. I'm going to show you now one last, but this is actually two minutes, because it's a mother and a daughter. And the mother's going to tell a, a, a story, and then the daughter will tell the story about the same person from 50 years farther on. Um, watch. When I was young, I signed on as a deckhand on a big, beautiful schooner that sailed the Caribbean. Once, we came into dock in Miami for repairs, and I found myself to be the only one who was really staying on the ship. I used to feed the sea cows scraps. And one day, one early one morning, I looked out and saw bubbles rising up out of the sea. I ran to get the scraps. I ran back. I threw them on the ocean. And much to my shock and delight, a beautiful young man came up out of the midst of them. It turned out that he was a uh, skin diver who had been hired to scrape the barnacles off the bottom of the boat. As he boarded the boat, he uh, had some trouble with his wetsuit, and he asked me if I would help him with the zipper of his wetsuit. That night, I wrote my mother and dad and said, I have just met the man that I'm going to marry. 51 years with that beloved boy who came to me out of the depths of the sea. The ocean was always a symbol of my parents' love for one another. So when my father died after 50 years of marriage, we decided on a burial at sea. When we set sail that day, my mother told us that if we were to see a dolphin, it would be a symbol, a sign that my father was with us and we could spread his ashes. We saw no dolphin, but we spread his ashes anyway. As we sailed back to the marina, my mother suddenly cried out. I thought it was despair. Then she cried out again and I looked to see a dolphin keeping pace with us. Then my sister cried out, more dolphins, and when I looked again, there were three dolphins. When I looked again, there were five, then there were ten, then there were a hundred, then there were a thousand. When all was said and done that day, there were two thousand dolphins, maybe more, who kept pace with us. It was the rarest of occurrences. They call it a superpod. Dolphins as far as the eye could see. Um, what decision does, 
Chloe make? Chloe, I guess, and her mother. Spreading the ash, the decision that we're going to spread the ashes. And then another, yeah, right, I guess that's it, that, that decision. The universe usually doesn't give you dolphins, right? Just usually gives you, you know, and we accept it. And then what, what, what was the response of the universe? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, dolphins. Right. Every now and then the universe does give you dolphins, thousands and thousands of dolphins. When, if we could only know when the dolphins are going to come and when they're not going to come. Um, Walter Benjamin, uh, ill in this little town in the Pyrenees, waiting for uh, the visa that would, all, I mean, they, they, had, they had their papers though, so they could pass into Spain and then they would be able to get to Lisbon and get on a boat to New York. But when they went to cross the border, the customs agent told them that uh, all visas were now canceled, that Vichy government had canceled all visas and nobody was going to be allowed out of the country. Um, which, uh, profoundly depressed Walter Benjamin, and he killed himself that night. And the next day the order came through that all visas were good, and he just had to wait a day. Mr. Bungle sends his regards. Beautiful Mr. Bungle, who is with us always, and who always, always informs uh, our greatest stories. Uh, I will take questions and answers. Anyway, thank you very much. I do have a question. People tend to talk a lot. How do you get them down to a minute? <laughs> oh, not always so easy. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, it's interesting because it, it depends There are all sorts of, of tricks that have to be used, and sometimes they don't work. James, uh, who told the story about Troll, and is one of the great storytellers of the world. But um, he wanted to do this so much that he decided to be sober. And so he showed up, and he was sober, and he could not tell any stories. So finally, at some point, I said, James, drink a beer. And he did. And then I said, James, tell the story of Troll. But I knew he only had one shot. So I kind of went over it with him. And he kind of knew what he was doing. And that one came up. Other stories went too long. The same with Chloe. I had to make sure that we went over the story over. And so she knew every element, because we knew she, wasn't gonna get, you know, she wouldn't get another shot. Um, she wouldn't be able to do it again. So it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting exercise to work with people and to look for the essence. What is the essence of the story? What are you really telling about? So you can leave off this and this and this. And so a 10 minute story. Neil Gaiman's story about Amanda Palmer is a story he told for me on the Unchained tour. Um, it was a 10 minute story. And I said, what is the essence? And so it's a, an amazing exercise, and I think that's what we were doing here with the workshop folks, is this idea of if you boil a story down to one minute, you have to ask yourselves all the right questions about what is this story about. Who else? Thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't quite know how to formulate this into a question, but I guess it's just sharing of thoughts. Um, I'm a s I started out in performance as a slam poet. And in slam poetry, you're really much encouraged to explore the inside, bring out the emotion, explore your vulnerability, and to kind of share that with the world. In, in storytelling that we know, 
there's a lot of performance aspects. You know, we, and I kind of think about this idea that we kind of hide behind the story. We don't allow our emotions to be shown. What's interesting and what I've seen in the videos is that there's a whole performative aspect. Even with the lighting and the video, obviously they're, they're, when they're speaking these stories, they're doing into a camera. The lighting is really nicely done, but there's such vulnerability, and these are not experienced performance-based artists. How do you get to that point to allow, obviously they're not repeating their story like 20 times and rehearsing it. You can see there's, there's something, I don't know if you want to use the word authentic or whatever, but there's something about how do you get to the space and the point to allow that vulnerability to shine, but you're speaking to an artificial box, a camera, and you there's lighting in front of you. That that's fairly interesting. I don't know how that's done, but that's yeah, really I think, interesting. Yeah, I I didn't know at all whether this would work. I'm not pro video. I don't, you know, the moth. Uh, we are now on 400 radio stations. We're the most successful radio show in 30 years since since this American Life. We're the one. We're the third biggest podcast in the world. Uh, two and a half million downloads every month. Um, so pe people are listening and listening, and wherever I go in the world, uh, if they know who I am, people will come up to me to say thank you and tell me about a story that changed their life. And I have to tell them that I have never heard any of these podcast stories. I mean, I usually know them because I was there at the performance, but I never listen to the podcast. I don't care for the, I don't want to listen to that. I don't want that electronic medium. And I do a lot of hosting on the radio show, so then I have to listen to the, to the stories. But otherwise, I never listen on to the, I've never heard the radio show. Um, but not that I don't enjoy it. I mean, I think it's beautiful. But then somehow I thought, well, there's, this, there's something beautiful about doing these one minute stories. I just got so interested in it. But I didn't think it was going to work in part of my brain. But since I've done them, it seems as though for a lot of people, I'm dealing now, we're working now with a woman who was uh, a prostitute and she was raped um, and then went to the police and the police laughed at her and it took her four years to get to justice. And, and then finally her rapist was sent away for 60 years. Um, it's a story that she cannot tell on stage but she'll be able to tell in a sort of a series of these videos. So I think somehow the videos are a more intimate venue. James could never go on a stage, ever. Brenda can't go on a stage. A lot of these people could never go on a stage, but they can do it here. So I find it, um, you know, it's so, it's so fascinating for so many reasons. Wait, you, you just asked one. You can't, there's got to be other people. If they don't mind, you can ask, you can ask too. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a short question. Yes, okay. <laughs> Less than a minute? <laughs> Less than a minute. <laughs> Wait. Will these be audio and video? No, no, they'll be just like this. They'll be on the web. So you'll only, see the, you'll see the video. The face. They right, won't, they they won't be audio. They'll be video. Yes, ma'am. So I have a question about agency. Because I think that, of course, one of the wonderful things about telling a story is that it gives you a certain power over, over your own narrative, right? Um, and yet, you were talking about celebrities who tell ineffective stories because, in essence, they are successful. And people don't identify with that. Do you think that a classic fairy tale like Hansel and Gretel, where it has this great ending, right? They succeed, they're successful. Do you think that in this era, it's no longer possible to tell stories of success? Oh, no. I think there's a tremendous, tremendous desire. Um, uh, the reason Marvel comics become such successful movies is we want to see, there's a certain kind of fairy tale that we want to see, that we have a, an innate hunger to see. I just think it's interesting, there's something else that I need, and that a lot of people need, obviously millions and millions of people need moth-style stories. We need that personal story. And we also, you know, to go back to your question about the performative aspect, there is a sense, 
The reason I started them all, one of the, one of the things I was thinking of is I used to go to a lot of slam poetry. And you know, in New York, maybe not around here, but in New York, certainly back in the 90s, a lot of slam poets were, you know, they would go into that voice that, and then they would go, they would sort of have this stream of surrealistic non sequiturs like, my father's six pack of his own funeral above me in the bar of my own flowery demise, you know, and on and on, this stuff. And then they would end, thank God, finally. <laughs> and then there would be that light patter. And then they would say, so my next poem is all about, you know, well, it was inspired by my grandfather. I used to go fishing with my grandfather, and he'd drive up to the uh, Westchester in the morning. You know, he'd wake me up, and we'd go up. And, and I had this sense, well, these stories that introduced the poems were so much more powerful. The audience would get riveted when the stories were on, and then on would come this poem where, the, where immediately the performer would set up this artistic curtain in front saying, I am the artist. You are the receivers. And that magic of the story would be lost. And that's, so I went to Bob Holman, the director of the, of the New Yorican Poetry Slam, and I said, hey, Bob, could we one night just do the stories that introduce poems and forget the poems? And Bob laughed at me. And you should see, Bob, Bob has done a beautiful Sudden Owl video now. Um, and you know, he, of course, when I started the moth, he saw it. But, but I did sort of start the moth as a way to cut through that. And I know that there's a lot of stories that are still very performed, and I appreciate those performances. But for me, I love stories that have no fancy language and that are just uh, naked, personal, semi-true <laughs> stories. Do, do we have time for one more? I don't know what time it is. Do we have time? Uh-oh, the man. Well, I was just perceiving that the stories that work, the story, there are lots of stories of success, but the successes have to do with being broken. They come from a place of being broken. Like 2,000 dolphins. Right. Uh, that's that's a, like a shower of gold. Mm -hmm. But it comes from that moment of despair and giving up and surrender. Uh, from scattering the ashes anyway with no hope. And Jane, who gives her mother that one beautiful day, and then she finds the credit taken away from her. But that's a classic Buddhist move, isn't it? Yeah. It's not your ego that gave her this great day. It's the spirit that yeah. you gave it in. But, but it's true that, that wouldn't work with Hollywood. Right. What would work with Hollywood was the Neil Gaiman story, right? Because the Neil Gaiman story is a more classic sense of, I struggled, I overcame. And for that reason, I would say that of the stories, my own feeling is that the stories we saw tonight, I would say Neil's, to me, is the weakest. I love Neil, but I would say there was something about that I, I almost would rather that, that the call hadn't come, or something, you know? Just because, and, and, or, when Chloe sees the dolphins, success isn't quite the word. I mean, there is a sense of some transcendence, but, you know, her father's still gone. I don't know. That's really fascinating. Um, I guess we're about w one more, right? I mean, I, I don't know what the time thing is. I don't know what you guys want. I don't really have a question. And yeah. I just wanted to make a comment. I think what makes this video uh, so uh, beautiful is the three seconds that the camera waits after the story that you can see the person reliving it in their minds and you're there with them. Thank you, yes. I think that's really important. First time I did it, I cut them right off and then realized, can't do it. And you all remember when we were videotaping you, wait three seconds. Something about those three seconds sums things up. But I am, what are you doing? I'll have to separate you two. Um, 
<laughs> Wait, what do you want? What, do you have another question? You guys, there are other people. Does anybody feel disappointed? Does anybody really have, have a question you want to ask? Because I, I, I don't want to. And that, OK. One more question. That's it. So I'll try and make mine. You, just, you talked a bit about the last 20 years and this resurgence of personal narrative based stories. And I'm also of the belief, you know, someone that works in the storytelling arena, um, that I also, personally, I believe that we need to try to bring or try to recognize that we are also on the back of thousands of years of indigenous based stories and folk and traditional based stories. You talked about the wisdom, the nuggets of wisdom, the lights of wisdom. And I think each folk and traditional story offers this wisdom that we somehow are not packing into. So I guess that's my personal view. But where do you see the, within your work, within the, the context of the wider storytelling movement, where do you see the movement going? Uh, Kieran's the president of the International Storytelling Center, just so you know. Oh, you're Kieran. Oh, how are you? Yes, we've emailed, and you have so generously invited me to come, and, um, and I will. I, so that's very interesting. I, so this, this is very interesting, because these are, we're sort of two streams, two separate streams of, of a current. And, and in a lot of ways, there's a lot of interlap. I know you all do a lot of personal stories. Um, but personal stories had not been emphasized when the moth came along. There were individuals, Balding Gray and other individuals who were doing them, but they were uh, scripted stories, our idea of having kind of unscripted personal narratives. It certainly wasn't new. I mean, it's what everybody's been doing, as you say, for millennia. But it's a, we were recognizing this as an art. And that you didn't, performative elements weren't necessary. That what was necessary was just you telling this story, and yet it was a powerful art. And I think to some extent, that's what the moth has done. Um, I mean, I don't know if, I'm not certain we were the first to present personal true stories, but we're the first, you know, on a stage that were sort of unscripted. First that I, I sort of know about, um, and the first that got that attention. And now it's spread around the world. You know, we, there's a moth, either a moth or a moth clone in every major capital of the world. There's one that started recently in Ant Antarctica at the, International, you know, South Pole Station down there because they've got nothing to do but tell stories. So I, um, so I think it's really interesting, um, and I'm not sure exactly where these streams flow, but I do think that there is something new in that we are recognizing this personal storytelling as an art. It's no longer, you know, the the thing I always say is, if we could go back in time and see Homer recite the Iliad, or we could see him at the kitchen afterwards talking about his mother-in-law, we would almost all choose to see him talk about his mother-in-law. And yet, and he probably would be amazing. But we never recognized that as an art. We recognized the Iliad. We would recognize all religious tales. You know, there was always that sense of a religion has to be in a story somehow. There has to be some kind of, some kind of a purpose to a tale. So all the Uncle Remus tales are really religious tales. And there's always, to me, that distance set up with religion. Whereas what we are saying is, with our personal stories, it, it's a little bit like the introduction of the aria, you know, in the, in, in the late 1500s. When you have all this polyphonic religious sound, and suddenly you have the opera, and you have personal voices singing arias, and you have drama and Shakespeare bringing up individual characters to replace the old miracle plays, I see something about religion versus personal, and I'm not sure where I'm going with it. And uh, oh, now you're late. I, I don't know. It's up to you guys. I, don't I, th know. I think that we can take these last two, and then we'll have to. OK, two, and I'll be short with my answers. OK. Watch. Watch me with my one-minute thing. Get to the S. 
Since you're a novelist, how do you see this translating over to the written word? Do you see novels becoming novellas and everything shortening up? <laughs> I do see that these stories, I call, called this, and I forgot to mention this, that I called this the rise of the miniature novel. I sort of see these stories as being little, tiny novels. Um, and people are always asking me as a novelist how all of these stories I have heard inform my writing, and I'm never able to answer. They seem to be utterly different disciplines. And my uh, favorite writers are, you know, Henry James and um, John Cheever and uh, Vladimir Nabokov. They're not storyish people. So I don't know why I have, have this. I don't have that answer. I will find it and get back to you. And did you say there's Last one? Last one, yeah. Yes. Um, this isn't exactly a question, but I would like your feedback on it. Uh, I feel like for the people doing the videos, it's almost therapeutic because not only are we not used to hearing about those stories, we're not really used to being allowed to tell those stories. Uh, in normal conversation, people just aren't interested in them. And to be able to just look at a camera and say what you really feel is rare for a lot of people. Yeah, thank you. I believe that they are therapeutic and they are, you know, for a lot of these people, this sort of moment that I've distilled of their lives is something that their children can see and their grandchildren, and that might be the only thing that James's grandchildren will have of him. But I feel like a hundred years from now it will be resonating. I mean, it would be the more, imagine if we could have a one minute story from our pioneer ancestors, how beautiful that would be. And I'm gonna be collecting lots of these stories, so if you all wanna help me, um, get a hold of Joseph Sobol, um, and, or if you want to write down my email address, it's just my middle name is Dawes. It's Dawes at me.com. So if anybody would like to help either by telling a story or you want to just help collect story, then I would love to have that. And so once again, um, I would like to thank um, Patricia Wheeler and Joseph Sobol and all the, um, the our, our great tech people and um, the internet uh, what, and the uh, ETSU storytelling program. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>